Well, good morning. How are you? Happy Thanksgiving. Yes, a few days early, but happy Thanksgiving. I'm glad you're here. And speaking of Thanksgiving, um, let me just uh, say to you today, I want to say thank you to you. Um, I'll give you our official wrap-up of our simple project, which was uh, 100,000, one Wait, I'm not, how, how can you say that, right? It's math, so you got to get that right. It's $100,1637, right? So that's what our church gave uh, towards the Simple Project. And if you don't know what the Simple Project is, it's perfectly okay. Um, it is just our way to uh, work on building immersive environments for our children's ministry as we work on teaching in an experiential way how much God loves your kids and your grandkids. And so that's our effort uh, over the last few weeks together. So thank you. Thank you for each person who gave um, at, at whatever level. Uh, so, so grateful for that. Well, I'm glad you're here today. Um, I, I hope you have an opportunity to celebrate with uh, friends and family this week. And if you know anything about the history of Thanksgiving, you know that it really began, it began as like a small community's response. And then it became a colonial response and ultimately, eventually, our, our nation's response to divine provision and divine protection. Because gratitude, or like we like to say it, feeling thankful, um, is actually a, a universal experience for all of us. I mean, when good things happen, or maybe when you're on the bad side, the back side of uh, maybe a rough stretch, um, there's just this automatic feeling of, uh, of thankfulness or uh, feelings of gratitude. And for some people, that is thank goodness. For Jesus' followers, it is literally uh, thank God, but it is thank somebody or thank something, right? That we've moved past a rough stretch. And so we're all just instinctively, we, we feel thankful, even though we express it in different ways. And it's almost like we can't help it, but feel that way. Now, the reason I say it's almost like we can't help it because when it comes to expressing our gratitude to each other, it's not always that easy. It's not always so instinctive. Not only can we help it, oftentimes we do help it and we withhold our gratitude. And when we withhold gratitude, here's what happens. We actually create a gap in the relationship which creates a glitch in the relationship. And if it goes on for too long, it actually undermines the integrity of that relationship. Or if I could just put it bluntly, few things hurt more than ingratitude. And here's why. Because ingratitude communicates, we got, you gotta go back one. In, it communicates, it doesn't communicate, I'm so sorry, right? You can go back one and find that for me, right? Ingratitude communicates, I don't see you. I, I don't recognize you. Uh, or, or I don't recognize what you've done. I don't recognize your effort. I don't recognize your sacrifice. Ingratitude communicates, uh, you know what? You owe me that, so why would I thank you for that? Ingratitude hurts because it isn't neutral. In fact, it's the opposite of what is expected or earned or perhaps even deserved. And so it hurts, which is odd because the other person really didn't do anything to us. They just didn't do anything. And so there are few things more hurtful than ingratitude. But at the same time, there are few things more uncomfortable than pointing out someone's ingratitude, right? Right? Like, I mean, doesn't it just feel childish or weak to, to, to like, hey, what about a thank you once in a while? I, I mean, it's like, hey, you didn't say thank you for that, for what I did. Or, or you don't ever show me any appreciation. I mean, who wants to say that? To say that, doesn't it make you feel small, maybe insecure, and not to mention when you say that, uh, to the other person, <laughs> it, it, doesn't it kind of just say that the other person says, wait a minute, oh, and now bring this up for me, I'm so sorry. But what we hear whenever somebody says, oh, I'm so sorry that I didn't say thank you, we hear, oh, I'm so sorry, little baby who needs constant reassurance and affirmation. That's what we hear, right? 
And so even asking about or bringing up the subject of ingratitude is just so uncomfortable. Ingratitude, it's such a strange thing because, well, I mean, it's not even a thing. It's actually a lack of a thing. And it doesn't always come through silence or, or a lack of response. Sometimes ingratitude is actually expressed verbally. Uh, you've been given this situation, uh, and maybe because you've been in it, you, you, can, you, you understand. You do something for someone else, and instead of, saying, uh, instead of saying thank you, they explain that, well, you didn't do it right. You did something, but they tell you you didn't do it right. Or maybe you chose the wrong color. Yes, you did it, but you chose the wrong color. But in most cases, ingratitude is the absence of words or recognition of something that we've done. That, come on, it deserved recognition. We did it. The other really odd thing about ingratitude is this, is it's a big deal when we're on the receiving end of it. And in fact, it's all we can see when somebody has been ungrateful. But it's completely invisible to the ungrateful person, the culprit. Think about that. When we create a gap through our ingratitude, it's all the other person can see. <coughs> but, but we can't even see it at all. We're kind of clueless. In fact, we're, we're ob it's, it's obvious to the other party that we're clueless which in the moment makes the pain even that much worse. If I could just put it simply, the recipient is always aware, right? But the culprit is rarely aware. And it's just so odd. Now for me, I have to be really careful because outside of my family, it is just really easy for me to write off ungrateful people. And I, I hate to be that authentic with you, but I'm just gonna tell you the truth. It's really easy for me to write off ungrateful people. I, I mean, I, I, I can just easily be a one and done person because gratitude goes a long way with me. Uh, and, and ingratitude, well, it goes a long way with me as well. There are people, honestly, that I would have a difficult time extending generosity with my time or my influence or my resources because of how they didn't respond last time I was generous to them with my time, my influence, or my resources. And that's something, look, I'm just telling you, that's something I have to watch because as a Jesus follower, I am required to be generous regardless of how anybody else responds. So I have to watch that. But come on, it's a whole lot easier to extend generosity to grateful people, isn't it? And my reason for bringing this up and my reason for bringing me up in this is your accidental ingratitude, which you might not even be aware of, your ingratitude is leaving a mark and it is undermining your respectability and you don't know it. The ungrateful people that I struggle not to write off have no idea. The people who've uh, written you off because of your ingratitude, you have no idea. And look, if you're not family, they're not gonna tell you. They're just gonna move on. And the uncomfortable thing about me even talking about this is I am just sure that there are people who are listening who have experienced a lack of gratitude from me. And you know, and here's the point, I don't know who they are because I'm clueless that somehow I took them for granted. Ha have you ever felt taken for granted before? It's terrible, isn't it? it? It's degrading. It's one of the worst things you can experience. Now, think about this. If you've ever been accused of being ungrateful, and we all have, if you're like the rest of us, you probably got defensive when someone said that to you. And like, can I just tell you why we get defensive? It is it, because you felt like someone was accusing you of not feeling something. I mean, isn't that true? Like somebody says, I don't feel like you're grateful. I think you take me for granted. And immediately we get defensive and we be, we, because we, they, we feel like they're judging us. And because we think, you, how could you possibly know how I feel? Which is the point, by the way, they don't know how we feel. They know how they feel. They feel unappreciated and taken for granted. But we feel that, so we push back and we get defensive and we say things like this, but I am grateful. 
translated, I'm grateful on the inside. I have grateful thoughts. I have grateful feelings towards you. And while it's true, that is completely meaningless, isn't it? Because this is the point of today's message. Unexpressed gratitude is experienced by the other person as ingratitude. It's experienced by the other person as the opposite of what we've convinced ourselves we really feel and what we really think. So through the years of being a pastor, I've talked to lots of men in particular who are just super busy and they find themselves oftentimes a bit alienated from their families, sometimes from their children. And here's the advice I always give them. Here's what I say. And I've had to say this to myself. It's like, look, you love your kids in your heart but you don't love your kids on your calendar. And the calendar is what counts. The calendar is what connects. The calendar is what communicates what you feel. And the same goes for gratitude. It's the expression of gratitude, not the emotion that completes the, the circle and that closes this gap. It's what maintains the connection. Or to put it another way, gratitude and ingratitude determines that relationship for you. So important because gratitude and ingratitude determine how much you're willing to entrust to someone else. It determines how much they are willing to entrust to you. Because when you feel taken for granted and we instinctively, it's not just, a, it's not a decision. This is instinctively, by instinct, we withhold a part of ourselves in order not to get hurt when we feel taken for granted. Or think about it this way, because you've experienced this. Our heart gravitates towards recognition and gratitude. It's not a decision you made, it's a response and if you're married or you're in what you hope becomes a permanent relationship, here's a tip, and this is so important. Don't let the other person out grateful you. That's a really good contest to be in in a relationship. What I mean by that is the most grateful person in your loved one's life, be that person who's the most grateful in their life because their heart gravitates towards recognition and gratitude. So there's a famous story in the, uh, from the life of Jesus. And I'll just tell you, every time I read this story, it feels like uh, the gratitude bar gets raised a little bit. Every time I read this story, it's like, I wanna ride the gratitude ride, but how tall I have to be, it seems like I gotta be taller every time I read this story. And immediately I think about the people I'm grateful for in my heart that, I haven't, that, that they haven't heard it from my lips or from my thumbs or from my pen. And so Luke is the one who uh, tells us this story, and the story begins like this. Here's what he says. Now Jesus was on his way uh, to Jerusalem, and he traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee, which let me just tell you, is the middle of nowhere, all right? So they're out in absolutely this remote area in the middle of nowhere, and as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. People with leprosy, they basically kind of hovered between life and death. They weren't dead, but they also couldn't really live. And worse than that, imagine um, that they, they had to stand at a distance and watch everybody else live their lives. And, and in ancient times, leprosy was considered highly contagious, and people afflicted with, with leprosy don't experience pain like, like the rest of us do. And this is the part maybe that we have a, a hard time understanding maybe sometimes, but in a culture that only required physical labor to actually survive, you had to get out and do physical labor to live. That, that often resulted in, in, in injuries that either went unnoticed or unattended to. And so their bodies, a person with leprosy, their body would visibly deteriorate over time. And the Jewish law actually required somebody who had leprosy to live on the outskirts of town in a designated area. Aren't you glad we don't go by that law anymore? And any time they came towards town and they came towards civilization, they had to warn people that they were coming. And so lepers, what they would do is they would create their own communities and they would grow their own crops and try to survive together the very best that they could. 
And so like it would come as no surprise to Luke's first century readers that these 10 lepers, look at this, they, they stood at a distance with their faces covered and, and, and called out in a loud voice from that distance, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And they were in the middle of nowhere. And so apparently they've come to the edge of the village to get, a, to get supplies. And they recognize Jesus because they, they knew him from his reputation. And they call out Master, which was actually a little unusual for them to call him that. Because that was a title really reserved for those who were his continuous followers, like his disciples. And clearly these guys were not. But desperate times actually call for desperate measures. And if, if he could do what everybody says he can do, then he's actually their only hope. And Luke says that when they saw him, or when Jesus saw them, he said, go. They said, master, have mercy on us. And Jesus said, go, which is not really what they wanted to hear, right? Because that's what they had heard for years is just go, as in go away from me. But here's what Jesus was saying. He said, go and show yourself to the priest, which they must have thought, go and show the priest what? There's nothing to show besides the priests aren't all that excited to see us. In fact, nobody is. But Jesus had some reasons. Jesus had some reasons for saying this. The first reason was according to the law, anyone with any kind of skin disease had to go quarantine and then go see the priest. Bring that one up for me. See a priest to be given the all clear. So that was one of his reasons is, is I want you to go see the priest to be given all, all, the all clear. When Jesus said go, he was saying, by the time you get to the priest, you're gonna get the all clear. The, the, the second was when the 10 uh, healed lepers show up, the priest would ask, okay, how are all of you healed? And that would be a little unprecedented for that to happen. Clearly be a miracle, which would also, secondly, add to Jesus' reputation. That's another one of his reasons for them going. It would be impossible to argue that something unusual hadn't happened. And then the third reason, reason was their willingness to go before anything had happened or, or had changed would also be an expression of huge faith in Jesus. If nothing had changed on the way, <laughs> it would make fools of these lepers all over again. And so like there's a lot at stake here and a lot behind this request to actually go. And here's what happened next. As they obeyed, because as they went, they obeyed. As they went, they were cleansed. They literally walked by faith, which is a term thrown around the church in Christianity a lot, and this is literally what it means. They responded to the direction of Jesus before they knew the outcome. That's what it means to walk by faith. I know what Jesus has said. I know what God's telling me to do. And I'm just going to obey. I'm just going to go, even though I don't know what the outcome is going to be. I'm going to trust God here. But then here comes the twist in the story. And the reason, it, it, this twist is the reason why I'm even telling you this story today. One of them, look at this, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he went towards the priest and he saw that he was healed. One of them turned around and he came back. He turned around and returned to Jesus and he completed the loop. He filled the gap. He came back and look, he came back praising God in a loud voice and he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. No more social distancing for this guy, right? Right? He walked right up to Jesus and fell at his feet. He was not content to feel grateful. He demonstrated it. He expressed it. And I, 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 I think about it as, as much as we get ready to uh, go back to, the, to living among the living as he would, would think. I get to go back to living among the living and put all this behind me. And yet, even in the middle of that, he knew he had to close that gratitude loop. After all, Jesus had just given him his life back. And so he did 
what we all need to do, he went back to thank the one who had enabled him to be able to move forward with his life. And then Luke added five words that are so important about this leper. Luke said, and he was a Samaritan. The implication being the other nine were not. This man had experienced alienation and discrimination on multiple levels because Jews and Samaritans hated each other. He was extra grateful. And I think the reason this seemingly unimportant detail is there is because when you read Luke's gospel, he highlights Jesus' encounter always with outsiders. People in his first century audience would never expect Jesus to have anything to do with these outsiders. And specifically, a leper from Samaria. And over and over, it's the outsiders who seem to express the most gratitude because they were not confused about how undeserving they were. Their pride, their busyness did not get in the way of their effort to close the gratitude loop, especially with Jesus. As I pause right there for a minute, think about that and your gratitude to your heavenly father. And I'm just telling you, it's so easy as Christians, as church people, for our pride and our busyness to overshadow our gratefulness for what God has actually done for us. But this incident doesn't end here. Jesus asks a question. He says this. Jesus asks, we're not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? And of course, Jesus isn't really expecting an answer. He's just making a very painful observation that something is missing. Someone is missing. The other nine have missed the moment. The other nine have missed their opportunity. Something was incomplete and unfinished and open-ended. The circle isn't closed. But now the window to close that circle has closed. Now, look, if you're a parent or maybe you remember how you were raised, you get what Jesus is getting at already. Because when you were a kid and someone gave you a gift, one of your parents was standing there and they either said something or popped you on the back of the head and they would immediately say what? Say thank you. Like as in right now, say thank you. Like there was an urgency, like quick, say thank you right now. Time's running out. Close the circle, connect the dots. And that's Jesus' point. And the other nine missed the moment and the moment passed. How ungrateful. Their entire destiny had been changed. I mean, apart from Jesus and this intervention, they're gonna spend the rest of their lives trying to survive in the middle of nowhere and they wouldn't live long. And they've now been restored to their families and their children and they can provide again by working again. They can go to the temple and worship again. Where are they? And when we read this story, isn't it true that in our heads and maybe even in our hearts, we kind of respond the same way Jesus did? Yeah, wait a minute. Where are those guys? But maybe before we judge so harshly, I imagine if someone had confronted the other nine about their apparent lack of gratitude, I imagine they would have been so quick to respond like, what? We're us ungrateful? We are so grateful. Our hearts are filled with gratitude. I mean, the other nine, come on, they were people. They had to feel that, right? The problem is, like us, they didn't express it. And Jesus, like us, was baffled. And here's what he asked. He said, has no one returned to give praise to God except this outsider, this foreigner, this one that we're at odds with? Only one returner? And again, the question is a rebuke and it implies that the other lepers may have been Galileans like Jesus himself rather than Samaritans. And then he turns back to the one who returned and he said, I love this, rise and go. 
And of course, the second time he's told him to go, but this time there would be no reason for him to return. The circle was complete. And here's what Jesus told him. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has changed your soul. Your gratitude of coming back and acknowledging who I am has changed things inside of you. So to wrap up today, I want to give us a little thanks therapy to carry with us through this week. So let's just consider this our group therapy session for just a moment. And I would suggest, because I'm going to give you a few therapy notes, and I would suggest that maybe you open your phone and write a couple of these notes down to help you this next week. So this is what we'll call our thanks therapy notes. And we've already touched on the first one, so you might want to get this one down, which is simply this, that unexpressed gratitude communicates ingratitude. There's no neutral ground on this. Our feelings don't count because our feelings don't connect or close the loop. And even worse, think about this. The, the, the gratitude we feel but don't express is felt by the other person as the opposite of what we're feeling. We feel grateful. They feel unappreciated and taken for granted because we didn't express it. And this is important. Telling other people how grateful we are for someone else doesn't count either, even if that other person overhears us. And here's why I say that. If you're married, you know, you know this. There is a tendency, in fact, if you're a parent, you know there's a tendency to do this with your kids or your spouse. Bragging on them to other people in front of them, but never bragging or expressing gratitude directly to them does not close the loop. In fact, in some instances, that can actually be insulting. It's a good therapy note to know. Here's a second therapy note, and it's simply this. Ingratitude feels like rejection. Over time, unexpressed gratitude has the same effect as rejection, and it creates a gap. Again, our hearts gravitate towards acceptance. Uh, appreciation feels like acceptance. So if you want the heart of your child or your spouse or an employee or an associate or a neighbor or whatever, if you want their heart, express gratitude. You want to be surrounded by people who just do what they have to do to get by? Withhold it and take them from granted, for granted. No, they get a paycheck to do that. Oh, they're my husband. They're my, they're my wife. This is what they signed up for. That's what they should know. They moved in next door to me. This is what they get. This is just what they're supposed to do. And listen, when we think that way, you may keep their hands, but you will never have their hearts. They may stick around, but the relationship will eventually be bankrupt of intimacy. Let me give you a final therapy note, which is this. Is unexpressed gratitude may indicate an inflated view of you. Let me tell you why I say that. The message of ingratitude is this. I could have done this without you so I don't really owe you anything. I mean, isn't it true that arrogance and ingratitude generally are found under the same rock? I mean, arrogant people are generally ungrateful people and ungrateful people usually come across as arrogant. I, 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 I wanna be really honest with you for, for just a moment by asking this question. Is expressing your gratitude difficult for you? Are you more comfortable pointing out how someone could have done it better rather than recognizing how good it was? If so, the question is, is have you ever done any thanks therapy, digging in, working around, trying to figure out why you're kind of wired that way? And if not, if you've never done that work, can I give you a starting point? Here's a hint. Gratitude feels like an admission of weakness. It makes you feel like you may not have been able to accomplish what you accomplished without help. And guess what? You couldn't have 
Because bobbing in your wake of your progress in the wake of our, our success, maybe in the rear view mirror, professionally, academically, financially, relationally, athletically, spiritually, are dozens of people who facilitated your progress and your success. And acknowledging their role, look, it is not, it is, it is not weakness. It's maturity. It's evidence you've let go of an inflated, unhealthy sense of independence. Every day when I leave my house, on my fence, at my gate, sets a little plastic resin turtle on the top of a fence post. And a friend of mine put it there for me. After he heard me say that if you ever see a turtle on a fence post, you'll know he didn't get there by himself. And every day when I leave my house, there's that turtle looking at me, every day. And I'm so thankful to my friend who put it there as a daily reminder is that whatever I'm off to go do, and as I come home, whatever I'm coming home to engage in, I could not do that alone. Gratitude, and I need that reminder daily, because gratitude is evidence that you have life in proper perspective. You would not be where you are without the support and the help of other people. You do actually owe a debt of gratitude, and that's okay. So back to the story for just a second. Let's be the one who went back to thank the one who enabled him to move forward. Why not make it a habit of our lives to go back to the people who've allowed us to move forward? And so here's a question. Who helped you move forward? Who is helping you move forward? Have you ever thanked them or have you thanked them recently? I mean, sure, you pay them or sure, they married you and sure, they're your mom. Have you expressed your gratitude lately? I mean, you may feel it when you think about it, but if, have you expressed it verbally? And if not, why not? Could it be that in fact, you might be more like the nine than the one than you thought? That maybe you took what was given, but got distracted by the new opportunity. Distracted maybe by the new freedom by the new recognition, the new position, and then you just went on your merry way without circling back to say thank you. I mean, if somebody told your story, and from where I sit, let me just say, when we tell your story, because we will one day tell your story, like one day someone will tell mine, let me just ask, will you be the story of the one or is your story gonna be the story of the nine? Because when we get to those moments, it is so glaring of who was the one and who was the nine. And here's the good news, here's the great news. You get to decide. And here's how. You get to decide one expression of gratitude at a time. So as you go into this week of Thanksgiving, who do you owe a verbal debt of gratitude? Who has, who is facilitating your progress and your success? What if we just would not let this be a week of Thanksgiving, but let's make it a week of Thanksgiving? Why? because being thankful is good for everyone's soul. Let me pray for us. Father, we wanna pause and say thank you to you. Thank you for the uh, way you love us. Thank you for the gifts you've given us with that highest priority gift being your son, Jesus. Thank you that it changed our lives and Father, as we learn as your followers how brutal 
it was to give that gift, how costly it was for what you did for us. God, would you help us not to be those people that take you for granted? And oftentimes it's so easy for us as church people to come into church and because we're busy or because we're off doing our thing or because maybe we have an inflated view of ourselves and how we got to where we are, we forget that it is you that gave us the opportunity to move forward in our life first and foremost. And so God, would you challenge our hearts today to go back to you and in whatever way, whatever way, say thank you to you for what you've given us and the opportunity to move forward in our life. But Father, there's people in our life. And it's easy for us to say thanks to you sometimes, God, and forget the people around us, which is the message today. And so Father, we don't want to communicate rejection to you, and we certainly don't want to communicate rejection to the people you love that you've put in our life to move us forward. So would you help us this week to let it be a week of thanksgiving to those who have helped us move forward. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.